really but it's something that has to be addressed. We at the Office of the Sheriff try to enlighten, bring those issues to the community, let them know it's all right to talk about mental health. Mental health affects so many of us. Mental health has no certain face, color, creed, religion. Mental health affects the majority of our family members but a lot of us choose not to address it. Mental health is something that can tear and is tearing our nation apart. We have to stay on top of this issue. We have to be in a, in a place where we're leading the charge to give people the help, the information, and also embrace them in coming forth with this particular issue. We have to turn the page on looking a blind eye to mental health. Mental health also crosses the barriers into what we call violence. A lot of times when mental health is untreated, it leads to issues financially, it leads to issues faith-based, it leads to issues in violence that we see across America each and every day. A lot of that violence has to do with guns, which is horrifying. So we say at the Office of the Sheriff, we take a stance. We want to enlighten those. We want to bring the information out to the communities, give people a choice, give people a chance to be able to take hold to their lives, give them the tools give them the resources to be able to make that change. Because if we don't, there's going to be a lot of unnecessary hardship that will continue to go on in this country. And I'll say that and turn it over to my colleague, Major Carr, and his viewpoints from his aspect. So I'm, I'm definitely glad to be here today, and I'm glad that we have this panel. This panel pretty much breaks it down from faith base to social and economic, you know, uh, uh, financial from that standpoint. And coming from the law enforcement standpoint, when we look at mental health, I mean, it's, it's not only just generational, it's not only no social economic, it deals with everybody. It has no face, as Colonel Terry was saying, uh, and it touches everybody. But you look at certain communities deal with mental health completely different. You have those communities that what goes on in our house stays in our house. We don't want to talk about it, it's taboo. You know, we'll address it, we'll deal with it. You have those uh, communities that will go out, they will talk about it, but they don't have the resources or the knowledge or information to actually understand exactly the person's diagnosis. Uh, we've seen an uptake in active shooters where people have actually gone to schools. Uh, there have actually been violence in the home. Uh, and this is dealing with weapons and mental health. Those aspects of people who have not been diagnosed or people who we say or we stigma or we, we have some type of stereotype, excuse me, some type of stereotype to this person to say, well, this person isn't right. Something's wrong with this person. But we haven't looked to see what resources we can provide for that person. At the sheriff's office, uh, we try to touch those people. We have what we call emergency petition services, what we call EPS, where we actually take these people and we take them to a clinical technician or some sort of uh, doctor at a hospital here in Prince George's County so they can be diagnosed, so they can be evaluated. The state of Maryland has also passed legislation, what we call the Extreme Risk Protective Order. And this Extreme Risk Protective Order is to remove any firearms that may be accessible by those people who may be uh, deemed as having uh, mental health issues. Uh, we don't want to label anybody as far as, hey, this person has a mental health issue. We want to bring this out into light to say that, hey, if you have an issue, seek the resources, look for the information. And from a law enforcement standpoint, we want to try to provide that information for these people. We want to include them into our communities and let them know that it is okay. Let them know that if you are having some issues that you could speak to somebody and it's something that you can do instead of keeping it to themselves and acting out in violence. From the law enforcement standpoint, we must treat everybody the same. We must look at everybody the same. 
I have no idea, just based off of somebody's looks, appearance, that they have a mental issue. We send our, our officers or our deputies to special training to sympathize, to, to show some sort of empathy to these people, to understand if somebody ha is uh, schizophrenic, how this person may be reacting, how this person may act. You wouldn't treat somebody as a criminal because they're actually going through something. They're actually speaking out or they're, they're, they're trying to uh, seek some assistance. We want to make sure that we're able to identify those uh, triggers or those signs and actually provide them uh, help. And that will be it for my, my piece. Thank you very much, uh, Major Carr. We appreciate your, your words of wisdom. Um, in fact, um, we realize the, the problems of, of violence in our neighborhood is so important. So it, we're very privileged that both of you are working in our communities to improve these situations. And now we're going to go to our next speaker, who is Dr. Bull. His words of wisdom for us. I uh, want to reiterate, I am absolutely thrilled. You sit back a little tiny bit so I can see my colleagues over here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, many of you in the viewing audience, and this is going out to thousands of people all over the world, and it's essentially important that they know people like Minister Jefferson, and Mr. G, and yourselves. Uh, Mr. Terry didn't get his stripes the easy way. He worked hard for them. And I've got to say this about him because I know him. He's a real people person. People see the police officer and the badge, and there's the negative connotation because of what's happened in the past. And I can attest to how he works with people. I myself had a very tragic situation as I lost uh, a daughter of mine in police custody. And that was the other bland in New Jersey, the two. One in New Jersey, one in Texas. So we know what parents go through, and we try to deal with my primary issues with solve some of the problems. I've got a, a, a particular question for the both of you. Uh, we know that mental health and economic wellness are inextricably tied together. The self-sufficiency of a community to be more financially literate is tied together. What is the, uh, uh, the department doing today and being able to vet out some of the bad officers. There's only a handful. You may have 2,000 officers, wherever it might be, anywhere in the country. But you'll get that 1% that creates the biggest problem and the worst images about law enforcement. Law enforcement is not an easy task today. And thank God that we have the cameras for each of the officers today. And it's mandatory that they use these cameras it vets out those lies that may come from the perpetrator or from the officer. Uh, is there counseling now uh, for the police officers within the sheriff's department? Uh, I've said, said this in prime meetings, but I think, this is my own belief, that every five years, I believe, for a career officer, that officer should be reviewed in terms of their capacity to provide that service. Being a law officer is a very, very difficult process. You don't know who's coming from behind the bush to the building. When you pull someone over for a, a, a stop for a minor infraction as to whether they're going to pull a revolver on you. But that small percentage of abusive officer, and you can always see most often when someone is getting to that point, but if we do nothing, we exacerbate the problem. And the second question, is the courts doing anything substantive to assist families when these mothers in particular, not just the fathers, but the mothers want aid and support for their child, their son or daughter who's bipolar? And they want you, they're begging the department, they're begging the court, find a solution for them because the mothers can't handle them. And we look at the recidivism rate today, that's too high. We're the only country in the world with close to two million incarcerates. And it doesn't make sense. We're a great people and what creates a circumstance? But I, I, I know the influence of many accidents or things that occur 
in the course of doing uh, your job has a lot to do with TV and what they see in the movies. And it's smart to talk back to an officer, give an officer a hard time. They tend to forget that the officers themselves are also human. Mm -hmm. and why do you have to push that negative button in my face? Why can't you respect me for the job that I've got now in this instance? Well, something has to happen in the training process of the officer because he becomes what? The psychologist? <laughs> He's the social expert? And he doesn't have to know anything about psychiatry, but he picks up the role and responsibility of what has to happen to resolve an issue before it exacerbates itself. I know that's a long-winded question because it's in four pieces, but uh, between the two of you, especially you, Tim, you can right. please, please yes, respond. To that. I'll take the first part being um, the process of hiring officers or deputies. Our process is painstaking. Out of a thousand applicants, you may get one deputy. Mm. The process encompasses background checks. It also goes through a mental evaluation period. It looks through criminal history. It looks at drug use. It also, in some aspects, looks at common sense. You see, a lot of things in police work or law enforcement, um, it's right and wrong, but a lot of it has to do with common sense. Communicating, be able to be able to communicate with your fellow man or woman. That's most important for the office of the sheriff. Anybody can try to put on a badge and gun and enforce, mm. yeah. but it takes that special individual to communicate with one's community. Be invested. We look for, 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 for deputies who are invested in the community not just taking from the community. See, that's very important when you look at law enforcement. You know, if you're not tied to that community, you have no affiliation with that community, Absolutely. your empathy for those Absolutely. who are in that community is very little. So from the aspect of the Office of the Sheriff, we look for all of those characteristics. We look for those men and women who want to serve for the right reason. And see, the right reason is serving your fellow man and woman. Not for self, but for others. See, when you get into law enforcement for self, when you talk about those who uh, turn yeah. a blind eye, yeah. that's what happens. Because they're not serving others, they're serving self. And just like you doing anything else, when you start being self-serving, you don't look at the total picture of helping one another. So in that aspect, as far as the process, there is a lengthy process, but the bottom line, you have to want to serve those in your community and be convicted in such a manner that you don't lose sight of what's right and what's wrong. Because you're being put in a lot of situations that you're the only deterrent from what's right and what's wrong. Absolutely. No and if you don't stay the course, mm -hmm. then how can others stay the course? Because you are that guiding light, no matter how you may see it, no matter if you're being ridiculed or being talked about, you still represent something higher than yourself. That means that you must stay the course. I've been in law enforcement over 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I have to take that to work each and every day and not lose sight of why I'm there. Not lose sight of why the citizens of my county, Prince George's County, has entrusted me to guard them each and every day. To entrust me to make sure that their family members, sons and daughters, aunts, uncles, mothers and fathers, are treated with respect and dignity every time we go out to do our particular job. So 
In summary, Dr. Bland. Well, don't want you to get away because you had some other questions. What about <laughs> diversity in the department? Men and women, opportunities for growth, and what future it holds for us as black Americans in this country? At the office of the sheriff? Yes. And that's what I speak of, and that's what I know. Diversity over the last 10 years have been tremendous. We have hired numerous women, Hispanics, black, people of all nationalities have been coming to the office of the sheriff to participate. Because you have to change because of the diversity that's in the community. Mm -hmm. The community has to somewhat adapt to those who are entrusted to guard them if you don't change your organization. So your organization has to take on some of the characteristics of your community yeah. to be able to Absolutely. relate, to Relative be able to good. talk, yeah. to be able to have those conversations yeah. with those that you serve. Doesn't mean that has to be an end all be all, mm -hmm. but that is a good foundation to start looking at those who you want to have invest in your community. Again, those who serve have to be invested in those they are charged. Absolutely. 100% agree. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Major. So I will, will piggyback off, and thank you, Dr. Bland, Please. piggyback off of uh, Colonel Terry uh, as far as the Sheriff's Office. We're going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> just law enforcement as a whole. Uh, you see us with this uniform on, this badge. Uh, you know, our duty belt, uh, and we're here, we're coming to do a job. But the uniform alone is, is, is just a costume if I don't have the trust of this community. That's if right. the, if right. the agency does not mirror the community uh, which it serves, then you're doing something wrong. So the agency itself is service, you know, to protect and serve. And we harp on the, the simple fact of service. You're actually interacting with these people at their worst times, at a time of need. You are not to go there and to create even more of a problem or issue or incite, you know, the folks there, right. situation. Right. You are supposed to be there to de-escalate. When they see you, they should say, hey, this problem is getting ready to be solved or somebody's here to help me. They should not fear That's you. what it should be. And right. right now, we have an issue as far as trust, right. you know. We're looking at the generational gaps. Uh, in my 18 years of service, I've worked in the training department. I've actually uh, was the commander of our internal affairs. A lot of that comes from uh, self-monitoring. You know, what we have at the sheriff's office and many law enforcement agencies is you have what they call uh, early morning signs, mm -hmm. you know, and you're looking at these different officers from their use of force mm -hmm. to their behavior, to their interactions, to, you know, uh, their reports in which they take on a day-to-day -day basis to monitor them, to make sure that these people are okay. A lot of times we don't really think that officers may be going through PTSD. They are human. And they are. You know, they That's are true. human. You know, who was to say that, hey, I'm going through a divorce right now and I have to go into work and yeah. I'm dealing with somebody in domestic violence? Mm -hmm. Who was to say that my child is sick and, you know, I'm still trying to make extra money yeah. in order to provide for them that when I come into work, I'm not going to take it out of somebody else. These are the things, as, as an agency, we need to watch for our own people. Because when we go out and we serve our community, we need to make sure that that's, that's their mindset, yeah, is to yeah, serve, yeah. and not to take out, and not to, you know, uh, make a situation worse. Uh, this year, unfortunately, uh, officer suicides are on the rise. You know, mm. you, you, you hear in the news, and just recently, unfortunately, we lost an, an officer in Montgomery County uh, yeah. due to a, a self-inflicted wound. You know, we don't pay attention to the fact that we're asking these people to serve, but we also need to make sure that they're taken care of as well. It's a symbiotic relationship that we must have with our community. And if we want to be law enforcement and we want to, you know, to serve our community, we need to listen to our community. I need to understand and address any issues that you may have. But first and foremost, I need to listen. When I respond to a scene, I need to listen. I need to hear exactly what goes on. 
We talk about command presence, but the issue is I need to know what's going on besides the text of this call in which I get on, on, on a, the radio, on my, you know, my computer system. I need to understand who are the individuals who I'm dealing with. They're much more than just the, what this person said on the telephone. I need to assess the situation and then be there to, you know, some empathy the and de-escalate de a situation. So law enforcement as a whole, we're trying to make some changes. Uh, we are having some trouble as far as recruiting because now you're looking at the generational gaps. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the generational gaps, mm -hmm. a lot of the younger or, or the youth have issues communicating. They're used to communicating through text. Mm -hmm. They're used to emails. They're not used to going to a door, yeah. speaking yeah. to someone, looking at them in their eyes and assessing the situation. We've had situations to where people who have actually gone into the academy aren't used to the stress levels of being in the academy. Where if they're not used to the stress levels of being in the academy, how can I put you in a stress level on that street? You need to understand exactly that this is, unfortunately, life and death situations that we deal with. You know, uh, I'm the deputy chief of our field operations, but we have warrants, child support, domestic violence. A lot of our stuff is court issue. Mm -hmm. When we go there, we pretty much know what the courts have told us, what we had to do. Mm -hmm. You know, when we do evictions, nobody, takes joy in having to remove somebody from their home. You know, we try to make sure that, hey, is there any other way that we can wind up doing this but still following the law? Because we don't get a chance to choose. We can't pick and choose when we follow the law. A judge has now said, I need to carry this out. What but how can it? I show up? What about immigrants? immigrants? A language barrier, being unable to yes. communicate oftentimes. They're honest people and they're fearful of any form of law enforcement yeah, yeah. because of where they come from in the past, yes. looking to migrate here. Yes. How do you deal with that? That is such a major issue in the mis-killing of... I, you know what? It keeps in my mind so many of those cases, as an example in New York where the officers jump and this guy, because he's selling a cigarette, a little Lucy, mm -hmm. how do you put show coal on somebody for that? I mean, that just upsets my, I get upset every time I think of it, so I try to be clear of what we all do. I mean, that's part of it. But when I see what happens to the immigrants, I recall, and this is not too long ago, an immigrant, she was there with the children, four children, Hispanic, didn't speak much English, and the sheriff's department knocked on the door. In fact, you know the officer, and I will talk later anymore, but she peed all over herself. She was that fearful. Huh. Well, Nerves. Well, and, traumatized. Uh, traumatized by it. Anything can happen in those situations. Is the department demanding or offering to the officers uh, language skills where they can learn to speak Spanish, to speak a little Chinese, or Mandarin, or something that might... Uh, it, it goes into training. A lot of things that happen in when you, what you just talked about, yeah. training, officers, deputies, law enforcement have to constantly train, have to be trained. Because once you stop learning, that's when you stop growing. And when I speak of that, you stop growing in the fact of not knowing how to treat others. Yeah. Because if yeah. you're the only person that you know, you're going to treat somebody in the same fashion. That's but true, there are so. other people in this world that you now have to train to be able yes. to talk with, to be able to interact with. By me putting my hand out to a person who is like me, they may receive that as friendship. Yes. But somebody of another culture, if She's I put my hand out mm -hmm. that way, may think I'm about to fight oh, them. Yes. So it's about knowing who you're dealing with having training being put in place to aid the deputies, aid the officers, aid law enforcement to be more knowledgeable, to be more compassionate in yeah. who they're dealing with. When you speak of immigrants, immigrants are only people yeah. who may act or speak differently than you are. That's it. They still deserve respect. They still deserve to be treated equally. They still deserve to be heard. 
we have to, in law enforcement, adapt to those things. And it's about constantly training and evolving our deputies and law enforcement officers to do such. So that's when I speak of training in order to be able to do a better job at serving, because they are part of the community. They are our citizens. They are the persons or persons that we are entrusted to serve and protect. So we must be able to give them the same privileges, the same courtesies, the same respect in how we go about doing our job. I, I look at officers and, and what we stress at the Office of the Sheriff, especially through Major Carr and his divisions, our biggest weapon, people may say, oh yeah, your biggest weapon, you got a gun. No, the biggest weapon any law enforcement person has is right. your mouth. Being able to communicate with people, that can get you in and out of a lot of trouble. Yeah. Your mouth can put you in a lot of trouble, and your mouth can get you out of a lot of trouble if you know how to communicate with people. So we must stress, communication is the key when we're dealing with the community. I have one I have question. question. I, I have one question okay. to him at this okay. I'm Mr. G. The largest population we have today growing is senior citizen population. Mm -hmm. They are the most vandalized and taken advantage of population than any of the populations. Is the, uh, are the officers being trained to be more sensitive uh, in dealing with the needs of that community? Alzheimer's sets in. A schizophrenia sets in, going back to Ms. Jefferson, Ms. Jefferson. Dementia. A dementia. These things become realities. I, I live amongst them, so I know what that is, at least on my age. And uh, they need help, we need help on a continual basis and more tolerance for our foolishness. As you know, oftentimes a senior will dial 911 because they thought they saw someone in the closet or they thought someone was sitting in the living room when they're in the bedroom. And you come and you guys do a great job. Fire department, likewise. They'll pull that chain accordingly. Uh, what's being done to ensure better protections and egress in and out of the buildings they come in or provide social assi assistance? Not that the department has to become socialist, but when you have them there and they commit these infractions, Major, maybe you in your, your division, you can clarify that a little better. Yes, so, and, and it goes both ways, even to your, your, your first question. Uh, it's about information, it's about knowledge, and community outreach. Okay. So for our seniors, we really need to have more community outreach. And we, we actually have a group that goes out and speaks to the seniors on a consistent basis. Yes, uh, matter of fact, and Colonel Terry has, a, that, that was, uh, under his group, in which they go and they speak to seniors and they talk to seniors. Uh, we even had before, we had a triad program, which would actually go out and work with the seniors at the uh, senior uh, assisted living homes. Uh, and it's about information, letting them know exactly what resources are out there and assisting them with that. As technology continues to grow, you have to look at, hey, is everybody on board with that? Yeah. When we talk yeah. about the language barriers. It's our job as a department <clears throat> to make sure that we have people who can actually speak and actually make sure, you know, speak that language and make sure they actually are able to provide assistance for those folks. We can't leave anybody behind. You know, our agency, again, has to mirror our community. And with our communication that we have with everybody, that's how we develop our trust. That's how we put people at ease to say that, hey, I'm familiar with this deputy. I'm familiar with this law enforcement officer. They seem to be nice. They're out in the community. Yeah. It should never be the only time you come into contact with law enforcement is when you have an issue. If that's the case, then we're doing our job wrong. Right. You oh, should see us on a consistent basis. <laughs> you should talk to us on a consistent basis. Not that something has to be wrong, but I'm part of this community too. Right. I live in the place that I serve. Right. So you see me, I will be at a shopping right. mall. I will go someplace. My kids grow up there. So we have to make sure that we're more inclusive in what we have. Now as, you know, immigrants come into our community, they have those fears. There is a cultural divide uh, you know, right now, as far as the Hispanic community, ICE, you know, with the yeah, federal agencies, sure. you know, we're local, 
We have to be mindful of that. So when we do try to go speak to somebody, we have to let them know and try to put them at ease. Again, Colonel Terry made mention to it. Your mouth and being able to communicate is your biggest, biggest weapon. It's your biggest tool that you actually biggest have. Tool. Because the, the biggest thing is, when we look at economics, you know, and we're here in Washington, D.C. right now, if a law enforcement officer were to get a call in Capitol Hill, will he still treat that person in Capitol Hill the same way if he were to go to Southeast Washington, right, D.C.? Right. You know, as law enforcement officers, it's our job to make sure that we treat everybody the same. It shouldn't make a difference about your zip code. It shouldn't make a difference about how big your wallet is. It shouldn't make a difference about, you know, your education. It should only be about what you need from us in our service and our communication and our ability to work together. Hey. Okay. So, so the question that I have. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So we you talk about uh, trust. Uh, we talk about fear, right? And just wanted to like uh, kind of piggyback on what Dr. Blaine said earlier. Uh, I came to this country when I was 18 years old as a new immigrant. And when I came in here, I was told the same thing that everybody tells, like, hey, you know, we don't like cops. We don't like police officer. They are bad people. That's the image it was portrayed to me. Okay, I'm being very honest with you. Then the whole prospecting actually changed when one of my friends actually became an officer in Fairfax County. And he came with the uniform and he shook my hand, he gave me a hug, right? Then I kind of realized and I had that paradigm shift at that point that like, wow, these are exactly people like me. This guy used to play with me, work with me, and now he's an officer. And uh, that kind of like, took that fear away from me, you know? So my question to you is, uh, we talk about senior citizens, we talk about immigrants, but what are you guys are doing in terms of like the young kids? Because the young kids, they are very active in social media nowadays. And social media, when we talk about it, it only portrays the bad part. You know, and yes, there are like a couple of good videos that I see, like officer doing the great thing. Like uh, one of the videos that I can tell you right now is one of the officer who carry a girl on the cop car, right, and drove to the hospital. And that kid today is 18 years old, graduating from high school, invited the officer. That's a very good moment, right? Uh, what are your department doing in terms of like dealing with the kids? Because if the kids, young kids, have that fear from the beginning then it's going to be very hard for you to recruit because they're not going to be police officer when they grow up. And also it's going to be very hard for you to get that trust factor. And the fear is always going to be there. It doesn't matter if they are new immigrant, they've been here, because the kids are the future. So what are you guys doing in your uh, service department that is reaching out to these kids? Because when I talk to 10 kids, I can promise you, eight kids will say, I don't like police officer. So what is your response to that? That's my question to you, okay? I'm, I'm glad so to uh, what we want to do is get ready to wrap up. So we definitely want you to re apply to that, and then we're going to open it up for questions okay. from the audience. So please. I, I, I'll reply. Uh, the Bureau of Court Services, which I am charged to lead, we have what we call community partnerships. Um, we're in the middle schools. At this particular time, we're in 16 of the 24 middle schools in Prince George's County. It is very imperative that we do that. Under the leadership of uh, Sheriff Hyde, children are our future. We have to enable the youth to be all they can be. We can't wait until they're in high school to start talking to them. We have to reach them at the youngest age possible to start that foundation, to let them know that when you see an officer, it's all right. But through our program, it's so much more. We want to embody the total person. We want to let them know that anything they want to achieve is achievable. So you have to allow them to be in an environment to feel that way. So in, in, in those particular classes that we lead, that is our structure. Our structure is to embody those particular and, and enhance those particular young people with the knowledge, with the, with the self-righteousness to go and do what they need to do. Um, we have classes on bullying. We have classes on self-esteem. We have classes on self-empowerment. For the young people, we also talk about social media, media, the do's and the don'ts. 
We have to talk to them at that young of an age to make them productive citizens from years and years um, to come. Because we don't want them, contrary to popular belief, we don't want to see them in our jail system. We don't want to see them in our court systems. It hurts my heart when I see young people coming to the courthouse each and every day incarcerated. Because that's one yes, less youth that could be productive and have a bright future. We want to help them grow. So at the Office of the Sheriff, our community partnership is about that. It also encompasses, Dr. Bland asked about it, senior citizens. Because coming and going. You come in this world as a young person, you leave out as an older person. So we have to cover both bases. And in the senior citizen aspect of it, we have to talk about uh, what we call cyberbullying. Senior citizens receive a lot of mail. Uh, if they own computers, email targeting them. We've been in trouble before to inform and keep our senior citizens safe from this type of vandalism, this type of predators. So we try to go and have that approach at the Office of the Sheriff that we have to address and take care of both the young and our senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we want to open it up. Mm. Mm. Are there any questions for the audience? <laughs> Yes, you can. Thank you. I'd like to, to say thank you to all of the panelists. This has really been a, a very, very rich presentation, as Dr. Glenn said it would be. Um, I work with Amnesty International, a human rights organization. Um, and one of the issues we're working on is gun violence. Um, and all of you have referenced it um, in some ways. Um, but one of the, the things that groups working on gun violence in the United States are doing of course, it's the federal legislation and the state legislation, but clearly community-led programs and initiatives to reduce violence are critical to that. And I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Geary um, if they, are, if you, either of you are involved in any types of initiatives like that, or if you're, you're, you're aware of any of those that you would refer to, and also to get ask the two officers if they would share their thoughts about those kinds of initiatives because my organization is making that one of our recommendations that we're trying to get people to, to, to push their members of Congress to fund more robustly. So, thank you. One of, the, one of the things that we're doing is we're asking our places of worship, uh, faith leaders to step up to the plate, and we are partnering with a lot of the uh, uh, different um, divisions within, um, like if you're in Ward 7, Ward 6, whatever the wards are, we're working with those con uh, those um, city council people, but we're also working with the, the six district, the different districts to have the police officers actually come in and do workshops at some of the places of worship. Um, some of the challenges is, is that a lot a lot of times they will send the African American um, police officers and the challenge that the faith community is having is with the white community. Uh, the white police officers. So there, um, there tends to be a little bit of a challenge there, but when they do address it, they've de dealt with the gun violence as well as the um, domestic violence, uh, very, uh, a whole lot. They've done a lot of work in the, the domestic violence and taking a spiritual approach, a holistic approach to addressing that, but blending all of those those areas together, the mental health specialists, the uh, police officers, as well as the clergy, and uh, they we have they have a breakfast that happens on um, I think it's the first Fridays, and um, they then also address those things as well. So we are addressing those from the aspect of the whole person health. Thank you. I think there was another question in the audience. Referring to mental health, we actually are partnering